I have a very uh, low voice. If anyone can't hear me, uh, please put up your hand. Uh, anyone who put up his hand is lying. Uh, you know, uh, I remember there was a story about my friend uh, Robert Nozick uh, once uh, said in a lecture, uh, can people in the back uh, uh, hear me? And someone yelled out, we can't hear you in the front. So he said, well, go in the back where you can <laughs> hear me. Uh, and what I'm going to be talking about today is uh, praxeology. Uh, some of the material uh, will be similar to uh, what was covered by uh, Professor Herbener in his lecture uh, this the past period, although I will stress more the philosophical aspects rather than the technical economics. Uh, I notice, I wonder why it is uh, after Professor Herbener's lectures, the students uh, crowd around him asking questions. <clears throat> after my lectures, they run away. <laughs> Wondered about that. Uh, all right. Uh, Praxeology is, as you know, the science of human action. Uh, sometimes, there's a bit of an ambiguity, sometimes people use the word to mean the distinctive method, the deductive method in, used in the study of human action. But as Mises introduced the term, it was to refer to the science, the discipline of study of human action rather than uh, the method. Uh, and uh, uh, praxeology is the <clears throat> best, I mean, is the science of human action. Economics is the best developed branch of praxe praxeology. Uh, there have sometimes been suggestions that uh, maybe there could be other branches of Praxeology at all, for example, a study of uh, armed conflict, but nothing ever comes of these. The discussion seems to be: well, people will say uh, possibly there are other there are other branches of praxeology, and and that's it. Some people like to uh, come up with classification schemes. Uh, I don't see there's much point to doing that, but if you want to waste your time on that, it's quite all right with me. Uh, so in uh, economics would be defined uh, as consisting of uh, economics of one person, Crusoe economics, and also uh, catalactics, the study of uh, exchange, principally monetary exchange. And most of the Mises' human action and also uh, Rothbard's man economy and state is devoted to catalactics. Now, as you know, the method used in praxeology differs from the method common among mainstream uh, economists. Uh, in what way is this? Well. Austrian economics doesn't use formal models where you have a math set it out in mathematical form and doesn't depend on testing the results of the model. In the mainstream economics, you would first develop a formal model and then subject it to testing. In Austrian economics, we don't do that. Because of these features, uh, Austrian economics has been criticized, especially by positivists and also followers of Karl Popper. Uh, there is a the uh, some people uh, with with some uh, reason classify Popper as himself a positivist, but he. Refuse, he said, no, no, he's definitely not a uh, positivist. And the logical positivists agreed with him on this. They said, no, no, you're not a positivist. So at least they agreed on that. But if you think uh, 
if you think he was a positivist, you could you could reply they, they're both wrong about it. Um, in fact, there was one story that uh, one of the leading uh, logical positivists, Hans Reichenbach, who was actually connect from uh, connect with a, a Berlin group that was close to positivists, refused to shake hands with Popper to indicate how strongly he opposed Popper's views. So in this talk, we'll be looking uh, at some of the criticisms that the these groups have raised against the Austrian distinctive method and how Austrians would respond to them. So before I do that, uh, we want to go over, uh, when we say praxeology is science of human action, what is an action? Action is purposeful behavior. You want something, so you use means to get it. For example, you want to learn Austrian economics, so you come to lectures, you read books, and so on. You have some a goal in mind, and then you pursue means to get it. Uh, so in an action, the goal or end serves to explain why you're behaving a certain way. Now, to understand this, it's good to contrast this. What would it be to deny this, to say that there aren't any actions, to deny that there are actions? Well, then we would say, well, there's behavior there. You can see bodies moving in certain ways. People are doing things, but their purpose or goal doesn't have anything to do with explaining what they're doing. They're just uh, behaviorists take this point of view. They say uh, what we're trying to do is to just look at uh, people's behavior externally. We see there are certain movements that people are making, and then we try to come up with uh, laws about how they, they're moving, but we don't try to, uh, we don't make any goal, any reference to people's ends or goals. So when we uh, talk about action, we're talking about mo usually movements of people's bodies. Uh, we can sometimes talk about action in the sense of thinking, thinking about a problem, uh, for example example, but that isn't the primary uh, sense of action. The, the action is movements of people's body. We, as I say, we can have ex exceptions. For example, suppose I said uh, uh, everyone who agrees with me on this point, please signify by remaining seated. So you've all remained seated, and so you've you're acting, you're agreeing with me. Uh, when I tried this, at, I mentioned this point at the Rothbard Graduate Seminar, Peter Klein did me the dirty trick of standing up, disagreeing with me. This threw me off my stride completely. But I see no one has done that in this group. So I, this is, in that respect, a much better group. I appreciate, <laughs> I appreciate that. So, as I say, uh, actions are, for the most part, out there in, in the world. Uh, so, uh, the, and it's obvious that if we try to think of it, it seems obvious that there are actions, that they're just there. We, we, and we'll be discussing various criticisms of that. But some people say, well... The way to show that suppose the way to show their actions is suppose you deny that their actions you you then you yourself would be acting because you're saying there aren't any actions but you're saying that in order to show there aren't any actions so you yourself are, by saying there aren't any actions they're showing that there are actions so they they place great stress on this argument. Now, as far as I'm concerned, that argument's perfectly all right, but 
it doesn't show all that much. I suppose we say, okay, that's a good argument uh, if someone says there aren't any actions, he himself is acting. Okay, so there's one action, so what? What is supposed to be the big deal about showing there is one action? We're concerned with actions out there in the world. Just saying there's one action doesn't seem to be all that much, although I suppose one could say it's a start, but it's not, uh, it's really not that significant, at least. If you believe me, some other people might have other views on the matter. So, praxeology begins either from the concept of action, according to Mises, or the axiom that man acts, the way Rothbard uh, phrased it. And from this, uh, together with some supplementary postulates, the rest of praxeology is deduced. Uh, and the deduction, this is, I think, a key point. The deduction used is what we would call material rather than formal. It doesn't operate mechanically, say, if you've taken a logic course, have people taken courses in logic here, or mathematical logic? How many have taken courses in mathematical logic? Uh, oh, oh, good, quite a, f uh, quite a few, so I'll have to be very careful what I say, not to make any mistakes about the, s the subject. You know, if people haven't taken the, if don't know the subject, then you can just make it up as you go along, but, you know, people can catch you out, then you're, then you're in big trouble. So in uh, mathematical logic, once you've set up a proof and you know the, ver I mean, set up, you symbolized uh, what you want to symbolize, you can carry out the deduction mechanically. You just follow certain rules that you've learned, and then you're, you can carry out your proof, but in praxeology, <coughs> it doesn't operate this way. You have to understand, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> you, you have to understand the meaning of each step as you go along. It was a very different process. And uh, <coughs> here are a few examples of what follows from the concept of an action. And again, uh, Professor Herbener went over some of these. Every action uses a means to, means to achieve an end. Again, you want something, so you say this is a means of getting it, and so that will enable you to get your end. Sometimes we can have cases where it's hard to separate the means and the end uh, there, but but we can, if we think about it, we'll be able to do that. And every action is a choice between alternatives. You you think, well, why did I do this? Why did you come to this lecture rather than going somewhere else? Uh, you would have a choice. You could have done something else. So you came here. And you came here because, at least at the time, that was your highest value alternative. You wanted to do that more than other things. Perhaps some of you are regretting having made that choice, but it's really too late. <laughs> uh, now, one point that's very important about means is a means is whatever an actor thinks will help him realize his goal. So it doesn't matter if, in fact, the means won't help. If you're trying to explain somebody's action, what counts are the uh, person's ideas about what uh, the means are. For example, uh, supposing I thought uh, I could make someone I don't like uh, disappear just by concentrating on an image of him and, and uh, hope willing him to disappear, that would be a very poor 
choice of means to attain that and it wouldn't work, at least I hope it wouldn't work because then I would have long since vanished. <laughs> but if you did that, that would you'd still be using a means to attain an end. Uh, in Mises, I'll give you a quotation from human act, from Mises, he says, in dealing with prices, economics does not ask what things are in the eyes of other people, but only what they are in the meaning of those intent on getting them. So uh, from the point of view of economics, it doesn't matter if, say, uh, supposing somebody thought that uh, smoking three packs a day of cigarettes was a great way of making sure you didn't get cancer, <laughs> that would still be a, uh, that, he, that would be the person's means to getting that end, even though he would be wrong. Uh, I will say, I'll just, I'm reminded that example reminds me of the story of the man who read how so much about how bad smoking is for your health that he gave up reading. <laughs> Uh, so, again, uh, when, if we're trying to explain an action, uh, what's important is what the actor prefers. Uh, praxeology is not a normative discipline that tells us what we should choose in some sense. It, it just says that we're dealing with what actions people do choose. Now, some people make the mistake here. They think, well, uh, according to praxeology, since all values are subjective, this is a statement about ethics that says there aren't any such things as values that you ought to choose in the sense you're wrong about them if you don't choose them in some kind of absolute sense. Uh, suppose somebody held, uh, you ought to, uh, you ought to be kind to other people. Some people would say that's something you ought to do whether you want to or not. So some people say, well, well, praxeology shows that all values are subjective, but that isn't, uh, praxeology is not making a claim about ethics. It isn't saying uh, there's no such thing as an objective art. It's just saying that uh, if we want to explain people's action, we're interested in the values that they themselves have, not, uh, not ones that they should choose, even in, in fact there are things people should choose in some absolute sense. Uh, praxeology is uncommitted on this point. Now, uh, <clears throat> we, we can, in one way, evaluate means as suitable or unsuitable to attain an end, uh, but ultimate ends can't be evaluated. We could say, if you, if you chose such and such, you won't be successful, that would be a statement we might make. For example, suppose uh, Mises makes this, and Rothbard make the statement, if you want to uh, end unemployment, <clears throat> minimum wage laws will not be a good means to enable you to do that. That's an objective statement. We can make this within praxeology. Just as if you want this, then this will or won't be a good way of getting it. But uh, it can't say, if you get to some goal and you just say, this is what I want, I don't have anything further on why, uh, on why I want that, <clears throat> then the praxeologist couldn't say anything, <clears throat> anything more. Uh, now, and I should say, again, make sure we understand the point. We can say in praxeology people 
can have bad means to attain a certain end that the the, uh, the means they select won't help them attain that end. But if we're trying to explain people's particular actions, what's important are the actions they, uh, in fact, I mean, are the means they themselves have, are their subjective views about it. So even if they think they're bad, even if they they are wrong about it, that still explains what they're doing. Now, in praxeology, we're not talking about particular actions that people do. Say, we're not, uh, see if you say people, you're coming here to listen to this lecture, that wouldn't be part of praxeology. What we're considering in praxeology is what you could call the form of an action, meaning what are the criteria for something being an action? What are the what does an action have to have to be an action? What are the general truths about action? So, and another point that's important is that praxeology doesn't make quantitative claims about action. For example, suppose we say uh, lowering the price of a good will, other things being equal, result in an increase in the quantity demanded. We can't deduce how much an increase in the quantity demanded will be because we're not making quantitative, uh, 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 we don't have quantitative judgments in praxeology. We're just, these aren't deducible from the concept of action. Uh, now, a key, uh, one key principle of praxeology is that only individuals act. Uh, it, it's it, very important not to misunderstand this view. Uh, the view isn't that only individuals exist, but only individuals act. For example, it isn't part of praxeology that there's no such thing as the United States or there's no such thing as uh, the species of all gorillas or there's no such thing as uh, the world population. It's not a, a judgment about whether nations or classes exist, but they only act through individuals. For example, uh, suppose we say the United States declared war on Japan December 8th, 1941. Uh, that statement would be analyzed by saying that uh, after a speech by President Roosevelt to Congress, uh, Congress voted a declaration of war, and as a result of that, various uh, relations between people things happen resulting in a, in a war. Now, uh, there are people who've denied that. There are people who say that uh, there are classes, act, and uh, uh, nations act. They're sort of, and, and this is a, that perhaps you might think that's an absurd view. How could anybody think that, say, uh, a group could act apart from the uh, people in it, but people have held that view. And at the time Mises was writing Human Action, remember the English edition came out in 1949 uh, based on an earlier German edition came out in 1940. That was a much more popular view than it is now. For example, uh, the... Uh, one of the professors at the University of Vienna was Otmar Spahn, who was a very strong opponent of Mises. They really hated each other. And he said, no, no, it isn't the individual who's first. First, you have the group, and individuals develop only out of the group. So that would be an example of someone who denied methodological individualism. And again, suppose we say, well, how do we know methodological individualism is true? How do we know uh, Spahn was wrong? Uh, the idea in praxeology is, well, we just think about what's involved in action, and then we 
grasp that this is true, that we see that only individuals act if we say that a nation acts. It has to be cashed out in terms of what the individuals are doing. Now, uh, as I mentioned at the start, now we're going to turn to the criticisms of the Austrian economics. Uh, most economists today follow methods that's like that used in the physical sciences. And what happens in the physical sciences is it's the, the scientists will construct theories that make quantitative predictions. Uh, and then after the theory is constructed according to a formal model, and then it's tested. Uh, now, the supporters of the mainstream method say that the method they use is the way science has progressed since the scientific revolution. What they will say is, uh, well, in the bad old days, uh, say under the Middle Ages, people thought they could figure out what was going on in the world just by looking at books or studying what Aristotle had said in various ancient writings. But that didn't get anywhere since the uh, scientific revolution with uh, Galileo and Kepler and Newton. We realized that the way to advance is to have we set up a theory and then we try to test it out and see the consequences. And I say, well, look, hasn't science been tremendously successful? Look at all the wonderful technology we have, the show Science Works. So this is what we should be doing in economics. Uh, so the Austrian response to this is that economics isn't like the physical sciences. We're not limited to observations of external objects uh, because we say, uh, if, say, I'm looking, uh, imagine a stone, I'm stone being thrown across the uh, a room, hopefully, one hopes not directed at me, uh, it wouldn't make sense, or maybe it would make sense, but it would probably not be a good idea to think, well, what was the stone, what did the stone have in mind while it's uh, proceeding toward its target? All we would be able to do is look at the stone's uh, movements and try to formulate some hypothesis about this. But action isn't like that. We know action from the inside, as it were. Say, you know uh, you have certain choices and uh, goals in mind. You have preferences, and this results in your action. You, you know this just because we do act. We do this all the time. Uh, so... Now, supposing the supporters of the physical science models say that their method is the only way to gain knowledge about the world, they say, you know, well, these praxeologists have all this nonsense about uh, a priori method. Uh, Paul Samuelson, who's one of the great uh, 20th century economists and very strong positivist, although he was a positivist in a somewhat older, different sense from that of the logical positivist. He said about the deductive Mises, he said something like, when I read uh, Mises, I tremble for my science. He said, this is obviously absurd. So supposing that the supporters of the physical science model say their method is the only way to gain knowledge about the world, this leads them into trouble. And, uh, how is that? Well, that claim, the claim that their method is the only one that works, is a philosophical claim. It's a claim about this is the only way of attaining knowledge, but it is itself isn't the result of modeling and testing. Have they 
that isn't it isn't a, it's just a, a philosophical claim about the world. So the question would come up. Uh, how is it that we can know this claim about the world if the claim is true? The claim says that the only way you can have knowledge about the world is by having, a, coming up with a formal model and then testing it, but that statement isn't a formal, part of a formal model, it isn't one that has been tested. So it would seem like people who say that are in trouble. Now, we now come to the uh, key question is, how do we know the principles of praxeology are true? And this question has led to much confusion, but I think the answer is simple, is that the action axiom is obviously true. It doesn't require support from anything else. It's just obvious or evident to us that we act, we do this all the time. We, we're always doing something or other. How could, how could this be questioned? How could one say, oh, well, there really aren't any actions. It just seems evident or obvious that they, they are. Uh, oh, there are many other examples of obviously true statements. For example, I have a body, or other people exist, or the earth is larger than I am. And there was a great uh, British philosopher who, early 20th century philosopher, uh, G. Moore, who wrote about this sort of obvious truth. Uh, and we could call these Moorean facts after this philosopher. One uh, story about him, he gave a famous talk on a proof of the external world where he said something like, well, uh, I'm holding up one hand and holding up another hand, so there are at least two objects, there are two things that exist. It's obvious that there is an external world. So what he was saying is there are some truths that aren't open to doubt. They're just obvious. They're not deniable. If someone says, oh, well, science has proved that there are no such thing as physical objects, that really wouldn't make sense. I mean, we could show by science that uh, physical objects don't have the inner structures that you might think they do, but that wouldn't be showing there aren't any physical objects. That would seem uh, uh, to be a very odd claim to make. Uh, so these obvious truths, I would say, are known to be true, and they won't be overthrown by future observation. For example, supposing I say, I exist, meaning I exist at this time, uh, no future observation will show that it's false. If we take this as meaning I exist at this particular time, uh, I mean, of course, unfortunately for me, it will be the case that the statement I exist will one day be false. I hope I hope not for a while. I mean, I, I give myself at least another three or four weeks. <laughs> I, I'm an optimist about these, these things. Uh, I wouldn't, you, you know, as, I wouldn't say, as you get older, you tend to think about this. I wouldn't say, just to give you some indication of how old I am, uh, I, uh, you probably, some of you have seen the, I Love Lucy program on television. Uh, I remember when this wasn't a rerun where people were talking about it when it was just getting started. But in any event, so uh, to get, it, if I say I exist now, no future observation will show, oh, this was a mistake. He really didn't exist he, given <laughs> its... It's not subject to overthrow. And this is one way of defining an a priori truth. It's perhaps not one 
that uh, you might have encountered before, but one way defining a priori truth is one that's not subject to further testing. Once you have it, that's it. There's nothing more. Now, some philosophers, uh, the great uh, W.V.L. Quine, the great Harvard philosopher, said there aren't any a priori truths, but it's not clear why should we think that, why should we think we don't know anything that's immune from further testing. It just seems there are such truths. Uh, now, how do we discover these obvious truths that are uh, Im immune to overthrow by future observations? Uh, supposing, in some cases, we can do uh, act in this way. Suppose I say, I don't exist. Uh, I can say this only if I do exist. So the fact that I've made the statement that I don't exist shows that my statement is false. Uh, this type of statement is called a performative contradiction, that the attempt to deny the statement shows that the statement is true. For example, uh, another example, suppose I said in English, I have never in my life spoken an English sentence. Well, that statement is an English sentence, so my saying that shows the statement is, tr is false. Now, should be kept in mind, this is not true of all a priori truths in the, in the sense of ones that are known to be true just by thinking about them. Uh, it would seem to be an a priori truth that two plus two equals four. If I don't know that, well, then I'm really in pretty big trouble. But suppose I say two plus two equals five, my making this statement doesn't show that two plus two equals four, just saying two plus two equals five doesn't isn't a performative contradiction. Now, when I give make this point, uh, somebody invariably will say, oh, but aren't all the important truths ones that uh, you know to be true just by performative contradiction? But I would suggest if you, you know, if someone says that, it isn't enough to say, well, uh, so-and-so says this, so that's what it is. You have to test them out. You have to see, is that true of a priori, important a priori truths, I think you'll find it isn't, but unless, of course, you, you defined a priori truths, important a priori truths, as just ones for which that uh, method worked, but that wouldn't get you very far. Now, isn't the claim that there are these obvious truths vulnerable to objection? Uh, how many of you have taken a uh, philosophy course where you do uh, metaphysics, or theory of knowledge, epistemology? Oh, good, good. So you probably in these classes uh, come up with uh, examples like this. Uh, what if I'm really a brain in a vat, but I'm manipulated by scientists to think I have a body? when I have exactly the same experiences I do now. So how could the claim say that I have a body be immune to being overthrown by further observation, given that I'd be having exactly the same experiences if I didn't have a body as if I did? Uh, so now, here again, I think is a key point that praxeology is not an attempt to answer the problem of external world skepticism. It's not, although uh, Mises and Rothbard were both very interested in philosophy and knew a lot about it, they aren't trying to answer this philosophical question, how do we know there's an external world? In this respect, Praxeology is like the other sciences. Uh, science takes for granted that the world exists. For example, in economics, suppose we had uh, someone saying, what is the cause of the 
recession of 2008. It wouldn't, it would be a very odd response if somebody said, oh, well, we can't talk about that. We haven't even shown there's an external world yet. How could we start talking about the causes of the depression? Uh, this isn't, we're taking in the sciences, we're taking the existence of the world as obvious. And it's not, again, it's not an attempt to solve the problem of other minds. It's not about what goes on in my mind or with my actions. It's about the concept of action. As somebody, again, I know this from uh, many years of experience, somebody will usually will come up and say, oh, well, even if I know that I act, how do I know this applies to anybody else? Well, again, it's you're not just talking about your own actions, you're talking about what is true of action as such. Uh, now, uh, uh, the point I've made is in conflict with Karl Popper's famous falsifiability criterion for scientific statements, because according to Popper, every scientific statement must be capable of being shown false by a future observation. So if there are these a priori truths that can't be shown false by future observation, then they wouldn't be scientific, according to Popper. Well, I'm about running out of time, so I'll just truncate my remarks and say, by saying the problem with what Popper is saying, and Mises pointed this out, is that Popper has just restricted science arbitrarily, saying, well, there aren't a priori statements, we, ones we just know to be true and aren't subject to overthrow by observation, because he's given this, as, he says, this is what a scientific statement is. But Mises says, well, if you're going to be uh, talk about science, you need to talk about what the sciences actually are, and then you'll find if you do that, there are, there is praxeology, there is economics, where there are such statements that are known to be true. And I'll just close by a story about uh, Mises and Popper. Popper had great respect for Mises. He if you look there, if you look at a there's a volume of Popper's correspondence where he he, he shows by what he says he thought very highly of Mises. He respected him as an outstanding th thinker. But it's clear that Mises didn't trust Popper at all. And I think we can see, at least methodologically, he had very good reasons not to do so. Okay, so thanks very much.